I think um, everyone would agree with me that we live in a very complex and complicated world, don't we? I think everybody would agree with me. It seems like everything now that man puts his mind to, everything he puts his hand to do, apart from God, turns into a hodgepodge of complex, complicated ideas. And what's even more interesting is these worldly people are highly intelligent. Just ask them. They're very smart, but yet when they come up with um, ideas, they're very complex, complicated. I uh, brought with me an example of uh, how endlessly complicated the world is. Um, it's an article from a philosopher of all things. Um, his name is V.M. Lipnov, and he wrote an article, article uh, entitled Endlessly Complicated World. I, w I want you to see if you can follow along with me. I challenge you uh, in this article. Uh, I quote here, what does it mean? God being discovered scientifically or super intelligent? And what is the future science dealing with an endlessly complicated world? Can a human intellect create any model, theory, concept, even primitive for an endlessly complicated object, unrecognizable in its parts? It is hardly to do so in terms of the contemporary science. In fact, all the science originally is constructed on an atomic logic acting in a linear world suggests the existence of independent and countable elements and the mathematics supporting the contemporary physics is based on pastoral experience with numbers. A herd of sheep can be divided to separate ones and can be counted. This is also surprising now um, how the science with this slight luggage in hand succeeds to penetrate into the deepest mysteries of the universe of the atom. This classic science method is operated in terms of the approach that suggests transition from simple to more complicated objects. Thus, the sense of modern science is to explain. But a human lexicon is also so important words as to understand and to believe. One of them rather belongs to the art, especially to the literature, which has um, the science uses the language of words and the other to the religion. But how all this can be joined together, how can formal mathematical expressions be ethnically colored, and how the scientifically discovered God, which has been invertibly reached by modern simple science, correlates with the religious God. Did you get it? Did you follow it? <laughs> You're a you're a better person than I am if you if you could figure out what he's trying to say here. Uh, I honestly couldn't really comprehend what he's trying to say, but how ironic it's titled The Endlessly Complicated World, and he certainly uh, is helping that along. But this is just one of the many examples of what happens to the mind and the thought patterns of men when they reject God. It turns complicated, doesn't it? Their ideas turn to disaster, and we're, we're witnessing that today. You know, when I read articles like this, and I have read articles from um, so-called ministers of God, and they become just this complicated, um, you really have to uh, follow along very closely if you're going to gain the understanding. But I think about that in terms of God's end time apostle and his example. What did he call the truth? He called it the plain truth. It wasn't a um, confusing play on words or meanings, but it was a plain truth. Another example of man's complicated and complex idea 
is the modern tax code. I want to pick on that since uh, uh, the IRS has held the top spot in the news here recently with the, um, the great idea of, of hiring 87,000 new IRS agents. Now that, surely that can't be complicated, right? Um, it's quite hilarious ac actually. And if you have tried uh, to do your own taxes, you'll appreciate the facts I'm about to give you. The Gettysburg Address is 269 words. The Declaration of Independence is 1,337 words. And the Holy Bible is only 773,000 words. However, the uh, tax laws have grown from 11,400 words in 1913 to 7 million words today. So I think that might be part of the problem here. Um, there are at least 480 different tax forms, each with many pages of instructions. Now, if you've ever tried to use the, what they call the easiest form possible, they call it, I think they call it the easy form. And it's called, I think, the 1040E. Even it, in its easiest uh, form, has 33 pages of instructions, and it's all in fine print. Good luck reading that. The IRS sends out 8 billion pages of forms and instructions each year. Laid end to end, they would stretch 28 times around the earth. Nearly 300,000 trees are cut down yearly produce the paper for all the IRS forms and instructions. Just think of the houses we could build if we got rid of the IRS. But as we know, it's quite complicated. It goes on, American taxpayers spend $200 billion and 5.4 billion hours working to comply with federal taxes each year. That is more than it takes to produce every car, truck, and van in the United States. Staggering facts, isn't it? How complicated is it? Well, the burden of compliance is the equivalent to a staff of three million people. And they're working full time for a year just to comply with taxes on individuals and businesses. The IRS employs about um, 100, 114,000 people. That's twice as many as the CIA and five times more than the FBI. And of course, to uncomplicate things, they want to hire another 87,000 IRS people with guns too. That should really help. Um, enforce um, the tax code. 60% of taxpayers must hire a professional to get through their own returns. Taxes eat up 38.2% of the average family's income. That's more than for food, clothing, and shelter combined. And that is only the federal tax. We're not talking about state, local, property, sales, tax, etc. Just goes on and on. Again, does that sound complicated? Everything, as I said, man's hand seems to do. It becomes complicated, doesn't it? What about the converted mind? Now, I know your mind, as I was reading through, this was probably already have the solution to this complicated mess, right? And you probably did that in just a matter of minutes, but the converted mind sees simple solutions to something the world spends a lifetime trying to fix. It's called the Bible. It's, taught, it's called tithing, isn't it? 10%, very clear. We don't need a tax form, do we? Just think what we could do with 187,000 people, put them to doing real work, farming, producing. 
One more example here of how complicated things have become, and I'm picking on the United States, but this is everywhere in the world. Man has bungled and complicated everything. Let's talk about uh, United States federal legislation. Congress has enacted approximately 200 to 600 statutes during each of its 112 biannual terms. So if you do the math, that's over 20,000 statutes that have been in, in, uh, enacted since 1789. You know, I can't get, I can't wrap my mind around the fact that we would hire congressmen and women to make more laws, to stack law on top of law, book upon book of laws that cannot be remembered or recalled. But yet, we hire these people to make laws, just to make laws. They got to do something, right? What's the solution? Your mind's already gone there, isn't it? Why? Because you're converted. You look to God. What's the solution? God's government. The Ten Commandments. Not 200 or 20,000 laws on the books. So from this little exercise, you begin to see how the world's mind works, how the carnal mind works. <clears throat> Why? Because <clears throat> they've rejected God. They're smarter than he is. They hate his laws, statutes, and judgments. They're pretty smart. Well, God, um, again, is very cl clear in um, his summation of what's going on. Let's go to um, Matthew 18, verse 3. Matthew 18, verse 3. I'm sorry, before I go there, let's go to Romans 1.28, sorry, Romans 1.28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. He's talking about a Satan-inspired mind, the carnal mind, perverted, depraved mind. Isn't that what we see? That's the mind that is making the decisions for us today. They're making the laws. No wonder we, we see them trying to destroy the children. Satan wants to destroy the children, they're a future. And yet they go right along with it because they have a debased, converted mind, perverted mind. But God calls it like it is. He doesn't mix words. He gets right to the point. They're debased. He turned them over to that mind because they rejected him. But the converted mind looks at the source of all knowledge. It looks to God's word. It's fueled by God's spirit. That spirit is the engine that motivates us, his people. And we do understand, hopefully we do, that God does have the answers. And we understand that he is preparing a people. He's training a people who have the answers. He's preparing a people that believe that God has the answers to our problems. He's preparing a people that truly seek him out for those answers through his word. And he's preparing a people that will implement it first in their own life. You cannot teach something you yourself have not experienced. God will not let that happen. You must prove to God that you can live it. It's one thing to say, to embrace it. It is a totally different 
thing to live it. How are we doing? Can we live this way of life? Do our families reflect this way of life? That we truly believe God. And the next step is we will enforce it. Again, it starts with the family. It starts at home. Can we enforce God's laws, statutes, His judgments in the home? That's the training ground for the kingdom. But God, make no mistake, God is preparing a people ready to rule. They will be ready. God's ways, His thinking, His logic, His statutes, His judgments are not complicated. They are very simple and to the point. And why is that? God, you know, He's He could have complicated His way of life, but He didn't. Why? Because it frees us up then to live life to its full. We're not saddled with taxes or in the world tomorrow we're not going to be saddled with those things we're going to have the freedom not to get bogged down in the complicated ideas of men governing people it just won't be there these men and women are going to be put to work farming producing it'll be a wonderful time It's been said that the great seal of truth is humility. I'm sorry, simplicity. <clears throat> the great seal of truth is simplicity. And that is so true, brethren. It is so true. So today I want to talk about simplicity in Christ. In fact, my title is simply Simplicity in Christ. Simplicity in Christ. Today we're going to look at that mindset of a simplistic person that is led by God's Spirit and how it differs from the natural human carnal fleshly mind. There's a big difference. We just kind of went through a little exercise to kind of point that out. But it's vastly different. And then we'll look at five dominant characteristics of a simplistic mind that is led by the Spirit of Christ. There are dominant characteristics of a simplistic person. And we'll cover some of those. Have you ever had someone come up to you and say, you're pretty simple-minded? <laughs> Did you get upset by that? I think it, Depending on who said it, uh, especially if it's a person in the world, I'd, I'd probably say thank you. I've been told that. No, I know you, you don't believe that, but yeah, I've been told that a lot. Um, but um, hopefully you wouldn't take offense to that. I see it as a, as a uh, good thing, um, especially if it's coming some, from somebody in the world, especially as we see, you know, I, I look out. They want to tell you how smart they are. And just look at the fruits. Look around you, right? They're so smart, so intelligent. And we're going south in a hurry. Hell is knocking at the door, folks. The evil, because they've turned their back on God. We're, just look at the fruits of their intelligence. It's a complicated mess, isn't it? And we're going to be able to do something about it in the near future. That's the good news. And we'll do it with a simplistic mind, as we'll see. One of the many meanings of simplicity is marked by, by or showing unaffected simplicity and lack of guile or worldly experience. Thank God for those who don't have that worldly experience. Isn't that wonderful? Lack of guile, a worldly experience. Naive ignorance of life. The naive assumption that things can only get better. Well, 
hopefully we have that naive sense that it is going to get better. We have that confidence that it will get better. There's a naive, simple creature with wide, friendly eyes, so eager to believe. Are we eager to believe God in simplicity? Albert Einstein said this. He said, when the solution is simple, God is answering. When the solution is simple, God is answering. Even Mr. Einstein believed that God does not complicate. And he's the most intelligent being in the universe. It's also been said that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Look at God. We're going to see how simplistic his mind is, and yet it is so sophisticated. The word uh, simplicity in the Greek is a noun. It's hapolots, H-A-P-L-O-T-E-S, which, which means unmixed, pure, as in wines or metals. Number two, of, of the mind without mixture of evil. It's free from guile, innocent and simple. It's open, sincere, and freedom from double-mindedness. Does that explain who we are in regards to our mind? Are we simple-minded? Well, I think we all can improve. The New Testament Greek lexicon says singleness, simplicity, sincerity, mental honesty. The virtue of one who is free from pretense and hypocrisy. Not self-seeking. Openness of heart manifesting itself by generosity. Again, are we simplistic people? Certainly our goal is to become simplistic. Let's look at some Bible examples that apply to um, these definitions. Let's go to um, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 12. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 12. I think the um, sermon ties in well with the sermonette. A simplistic mind is thankful. It is very thankful for what we know and understand. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 12. Paul talking about his integrity here. He says, For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conduct ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by grace of God and more abundantly toward you. This verse is Paul's affirmation of total sincerity and godliness and all things in his dealings with the Corinthians. Paul had, had integrity. He had uprightness of his behavior among them. He did not indulge in trickeries and devices of fleshly wisdom. His actions were open before God and themselves. If you read Paul's explanation here, there was no hidden deeds of darkness or dishonesty on his part. He was very open to the point. Paul had a very simplistic heart. And the key is in simplicity. It is an oppos opposition to double-mindedness. Simplistic Christians do, do not say one thing and mean another and act contrary to both. But their heart and their mouth go together. From the mouth, the heart speaks. And their, con their, their conduct agrees with both. That's hard to do, right? 
the mouth gets away from us sometimes. And it's not at one with the heart, but a simplistic pers person. Both their heart and mouth and their conduct agree with both. What they promise they mean to perform. And no deceitfulness is in them. The conscience, you know, as Paul said, bore that out. He witnessed that he behaved in a simplistic singleness of heart in godly sincerity. And that is a real challenge for you and I, isn't it, in this end time, to not get caught up in the world, in the anger, the strife out there, but become simplistic, simplistic in the heart. And don't let the world sear that sincere heart. Because it will, it can. So sincerity in Greek implies that a non-admixture of any foreign element. Of course, Paul had no sinister or selfish aims in his dealings with the Corinthians. Let's go to um, Acts 2. Verse 46. Acts 2, verse 46. Talking about a simplistic heart. So continually daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bed, bread from house to house. They ate their food, the gladness and simplicity of heart. They were, they were without deceit. They were without hypocrisy, either in their thanksgiving to God nor in their interaction with one another. And they had great sincerity. They were open and frank before God and with one another. You know, sometimes people take offense to people who are frank with them. And maybe we're just too sensitive, but they were open to one another. They went to one another. Matthew 18, they didn't, something bother them. They went to their brother and they worked it out. But some today take offense when people are frank about their beliefs or, I'm sorry, about their feelings. Um, What's a shame in itself sometimes. But it reminds me of the place of safety. You know, there's coming a time that this scripture is going to hold true again. We're going to have to practice sincerity of, of heart in our dealings with one another. We're going to be in close contact with one another. It will help determine who has a sim simplistic heart. Um, but we... Again, we'll have to be open to one another. But these are some of the uh, attributes of a simplistic person. Now let's add another dimension to uh, simplicity that is in Christ. Let's go to Psalms 19, verse 7. Psalms 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord, testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Making wise the simple. The Subtugent and the, the Vulgate and others versions render it babes or children. That's what God's law does. It's perfect, converting the soul, converting us into babes or children. I want to read from the new John Gill exposition. exposition. It says, and here it intends babes and children, not in years, but in understanding to whom God is pleased to reveal the truths of the gospel. 
when he hides them from the wise and the prudent. These simple ones are such who are sensible of their simplicity and folly and of their want for understanding or of understanding, thinking themselves more foolish than any man and have not the understanding of a man. And these, by the word of God, are made wise to know themselves. Interesting, they're made wise to know themselves. Who are we apart from God? What are we capable of apart from God? We always must remember that and be very thankful that that God has called us out because if he didn't, we'd be just like him. We'd think just like him. So he goes on and says, they're made wise to know themselves. They know their folly. They know their sinfulness. They know right from wrong. They know their weaknesses. They know their imperfections and importance, impotence and are made wise unto salvation to know the right way to salvation through Christ or by Christ. But very enlightening comments here. So a simplistic mind is childlike in its demeanor. Let's go to... um, Matthew 11:25 Matthew 11:25 And the and that time Jesus answered and said I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Do you consider yourself a babe or do you consider your wise, yourself wise and prudent? God said he hid it from them, but he revealed it to the babes in Christ. Simplistic Christians are likened to babies who have that childlike demeanor. They must depend on their mother, their father. If you set a baby outside, shut the door, what's going to happen to it? It might be carried off by wild animals. It might, who knows what would happen to it, eventually starve to death. It cannot help itself. That is the demeanor that God is looking for in you and I. That we trust God, not because we have to, because we want to. He's a rock. And they understand their lack of wisdom. And the wisdom they do have, they do not trust in, as Christ said. They understand their weaknesses. Why? Because they need help to overcome them. And they commit themselves to God then through that power. It is a spirit of power. It is that power then that helps us in our times of weakness, in our frailties. We can call on that power. When we totally commit ourselves to God, we then begin to develop that childlike dependence as babies towards their parents. Simple childlike attitude. Example of that, several years ago in our former association, our church area um, decided we were gonna have a church camp out. It was a long weekend and it involved maybe four different churches in the area that came together and we had Sabbath services there at the campground having a wonderful time Saturday evening after uh, sundown we were all sitting around the campfire just enjoying one another's company and must have been about 
10.30 or so, we heard sirens, tornado sirens going off in the distance. In a nearby, a couple of towns nearby, we, we heard the tornado sirens and it began to, to rain and we all headed for our tents. Not much else we could do. Um, got in our tents and we were talking back and forth and someone was asked, what should we do? And I said, well, let's, first thing we need to do is pray. We always pray, ask God to intervene and let us enjoy the rain. What else could we do, right? We weren't acting um, irresponsible. We were out in the wilderness, right? We must trust God. So we all prayed and we all basically fell asleep um, listening to the sirens going off. It was raining, but there was no high winds. Um, but we, everyone had this attitude. Okay, there's a storm out there. And we prayed about it and we went off to sleep fully expecting God to intervene. We expected that, didn't we? Of course we did. The next morning um, we got up and somebody was listening to the weather and um, maybe some of you were even there, but someone listened to weather and there was uh, some, very, there were tornadoes that had touched on around us destroyed some barns and trees were down but it never came near us we had a little rain a little bit of wind but nothing they said they were 70 mile an hour winds but we were honkered down there god did not allow it to come near us but i was very pleased and impressed with the childlike attitude of god's people looking to god having confidence in his ability to save us And I think God was very pleased to see that. He was pleased to see that total dependence on him that he's looking for. I want to turn to um, Deuteronomy 1, verse 31, a very um, a favorite verse of mine that I've went back to very often, especially in times of trials and tests, in the, both in the physical and spiritual wilderness and it's a verse we must not forget if we are those babes in Christ Deuteronomy 1 verse 31 in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. How many times has God carried us as a father would carry a son or daughter? It's, I can't count it up in my life. And if you think about it, um, he's been there the whole journey. Hopefully he has been a father guiding his son or daughter, carrying them if need be. But that's how we should look at our journey as children, walking with God. He's there. He'll carry us if need be, like that son or daughter. He is looking for that childlike attitude that depends on him whether indoors or outdoors. You know, I've been in other camping situations um, where, or in the wilderness where I did not see this childlike trust in God. And it became very obvious. A um, couple stories, I only um, recall or talk about one of them. But I've been on camping trips and canoe trips and I have been shocked to see even some of our men that should know better lack that trust, that childlike attitude. Um, I recall being 
I was in the venture camp with Mr. Munson many times. And I, I think at this, the story I'm recalling, we were hiking the Tetons, the Teton Mountains in Wyoming. We had, we had been hiking all day and we, we, we had hiked into this canyon and there were steep mountains all around us and our, our voice would just echo through the canyon. And we had camped near a river, it was absolutely stunningly beautiful. And we'd set up camp, and uh, all of a sudden, a thunderstorm came up. Actually, there was not much rain. It was mainly a lot of thunder. Um, and as it echoed down that canyon, it seemed like everything just shook, including the trees. It was the most inspiring thing I had ever witnessed in a wilderness. And I said to the... Uh, young people there, I said, listen, this is how God's voice might sound like. It just reverberated and put hairs on your head, made your hair stand up. It was so overwhelming. Incredible noise. And I likened it to what God's voice might sound like. And as I was... Um, telling the young people that, all of a sudden one of the other staff members who was with us ran through the camp and he had lost it in absolute fear, running through the camp yelling, "Get run for your life, get in the tents, do it now. He's, he's screaming this and I'm just looking at him. This guy's lost it. Where is that childlike dependence on God we're gonna put kids in a tent where there's it's full of trees I want to know where that tree is falling right and it wasn't raining that hard it was just a lot of thunder and it and if you didn't know God you would be scared right but it was truly inspiring but this man ran through the camp totally fearful. Um, where was that trust and fear in God? That childlike trust out there in the wilderness. And all God was, I was just, um, all God was trying to do is talk to us. Show his power. But he lacked that childlike dependence and faith that God can protect us, especially in the wilderness. And we should expect that. We don't go, Mr. Munson never went out hiking or canoeing thinking that God's not going to protect us. We better not go if we think he's not. But we must believe that God is going to protect us. We must believe and put our life in his hands. Our life is not our own. It's in God's hands. That's that childlike demeanor. God, you can take my life at any time that you want because it's in your hands. You have total control. Put your life there and keep it there. And believe that he's got this. But when fear sets in, it's a telltale sign that you don't trust God. And then things go haywire. Again, when we develop that total dependence on God, on Him, in doing so, God shelters us. He shelters us from the gross errors he shelters us from the, the heresies. He shelters us from the pollutions of this world. He preserves us by the spirit power and the simplicity that's in Christ. That's how it works. But we must believe and trust in him. We are in the wilderness, absolute wilderness. 
spiritual and physical. And God must protect us from these errors or we will not make it if we depend on ourselves. We're not that smart. We don't have that wisdom. Our wisdom comes from God. Let's go to Matthew 18, verse 3. He gets right to the point here. He says, As surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as that little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now God ratchets it up here. How important is that childlike attitude, that simplicity that's required? Our goal is the kingdom of God, right? We must develop. The converted mind to trust God as that babe. You know, the particular qualities of little children commended by Jesus are this. They are humility, freedom from prejudice, teachable, lovableness, trustfulness, faithfulness, freedom from anxiety, and innocence. Receiving a little child in Jesus' name refers to complete acceptance of a childlike believer because of his innocence and unrestrained trust in God. And I would say unrestrained trust and faith in God. That's in a nutshell, sums up what simplicity in Christ is. We must all strive to be simplistic people of God. Why? Because our eternal life depends on it. It's not an option, brethren. It's not an option. Unless we become those little children, those babes in Christ, we will never be there, and that is sobering. We all want to be there. So simplistic thinking is one of the great keys to our ultimate success in reaching our goal of the kingdom of God. And we know what we're up against. We understand that Satan is pulling out all stops. He's a great deceiver. He deceives the whole world. And he's deceived many today. And many are being deceived. Even in the church of God. Paul had a concern about that deception in the church in his day. <clears throat> no different than it was today. Probably it's magnified in numbers today. But let's go to 2 uh, Corinthians 11, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve, by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul's concern was the same it is today. False prophets doing the work of Satan would deceive the church. And what did he say Satan would attack or corrupt? What does Satan hate? He hates that simplicity that is in Christ. A simplistic, pure mind and heart toward Christ, Satan hates. Because it is a key weapon in our spiritual warfare. As we read in Matthew 18, that childlike dependence to God is necessary even for eternal life. Satan the devil knows that. So it's, very, it's imperative that we perfect that simplicity. Understand that Satan does not change his tactics. He just refines them. Down through the history. Paul dealt with in his day. Deception was there. He's just refined it today. Just as um, they attacked, Satan attacked the church in Paul's day. He attacks it today viciously. And many let their guard down in terms of that simplicity. They succumb to these false ministers, false doctrines that have creeped in 
cunning craftiness of Satan. And many will lose out on eternal life. It's that serious. Let's go to 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. Again, God gets right to the point. 2 Timothy doesn't mix words. 2 Timothy 4, verse uh, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Where is that simplicity in Christ? It's gone. They will not endure any longer. But according to their own desires. Notice they go inward. It's all about I. It's what I think. Their own desires because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers. Well, if they don't like what this person says, it disagrees with them, they go somewhere else. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. So many, as Paul warned in his day, would turn. They would turn to falsehood. So it's important that we understand how a simplistic mind works if we're to uh, endure to the end. Now I want to take a few minutes um, to cover five points on how a simplistic mind works, how it works in Christ, or how, how it thinks. Point number one, a simplistic mind is led by the Spirit of Christ. Very important. A simplistic mind is led by the Spirit of Christ. Let's go to Romans 8, verse 9. Romans 8, verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. It is an impossibility to have a simplistic mind without the power and the help through God's Spirit. It is, it is called a carnal mind. It reverts back once you um, lose God's Spirit. Simplicity that is in Christ simply means that we're led by him. We have turned over our lives. We've talked about that. We, we look to him for all knowledge. We look to him for truth of life. Basically, our entire life is wrapped up in him. We get up in the morning. We think about God. At lunchtime, we think about God. At dinner, we think about God. Our life is wrapped up. As children, we depend on him. And his spirit then is identify, is identifier of who is his. The world has got it wrong. But it is what leads and directs a simplistic mind. Anything less would be a carnal mind, right? It must be fueled. Again, that engine that fuels our mind is God's spirit. That's what keeps us from the landmines. It keeps us from the deception. Point number two, a simplistic mind is not impressed with the world and what it has to offer. That's the furthest thing from its mind. A simplistic, simplistic mind is not impressed with what the world has to offer. In fact, it resists worldly, fleshly wisdom. It moves away. Get back, I can't stand it. It does not look to the world for answers to their problems. They don't look to the world for help. 
That's a lesson many never learned. And it was their downfall. It was a lesson even Israel coming out of Egypt never learned. The lesson is the world has nothing to offer us. Nothing. Nothing. And if we're not careful and diligent, the ideas, the thoughts of man can creep in. We've seen it over and over again. It began to water down God's word. And we begin then, even God's people, take more stock in a book that a man read who is void of the Spirit of God. Take more stock in that book than we do the clear word instructions of God. It's happened, brethren, over and over again. I've seen it in the ministry. Shame on us, those who have done that. Turn to the world for religious ideas, mixing good and evil. It cannot happen. We cannot turn back to the world. Does God... License, likens it to a dog who turns back to his vomit. It's a disgusting thing to see if you've ever seen it. But God, notice he gives a very clear warning to all of us. And he's talking about us today. We can't shrug it off as, oh, that was Israel. No, it's us today. This is preserved for you and I. Isaiah 30, 1 through 3. Isaiah 30. One through three. He's talking to us today, surely, as he did Israel. More so to us. And there's proof of that right here. Isaiah 30, one through three. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel but not of me, and who devise plans but not of my spirit. They reject his spirit. They go out, launch into the world. Isn't that what's happened? But not of me and who devise plans, again, not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice. They didn't even look to God. To strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and the trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the strength of the Pharaoh shall be your shame. And trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. And many have lost out. Because they looked to Egypt. They got tired. They got complacent. And went to look to Egypt for help. Back to the world. How important is that we uh, maintain that childlike faith and trust in God. It is so important. God repeats himself. Let's go to Isaiah 31, 1 through 3. He basically repeats himself again to make sure we get it. But he shows how he views those who do not put their full unwavering trust in him as that childlike faith and trust. Isaiah 31, 1 through 3. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and will not call back his words, but will rise against the house of evildoers and against the help of those who work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men and not God. And their horses are flesh and not spirit. He's, he's contrasting between physical man. And you have the option to call on his spirit. He said, why, why would we do that? He says they're mere men. When the Lord stretches out his hand, both he who helps will fall. And who... His help will fall down. They all will perish together. Pretty harsh words for those who turn back or look to Egypt. It just simply means you have pushed God out of the way. You don't have no need for him. But a converted mind understands the danger and diligent works to come out of the world and stay out. 
Christ said, come out of her, my people, lest you partake of her punishments. Punishment is coming, just like God said it would when you look to Egypt. Very strong feelings God has for those who turn away from him. He sees it. We need to get back to him, look to him. Point number three, a simplistic mind proves all things. It proves all things. And how does it go about that? What is its foundational reference point? I think we all know it's the Word of God. I think Mr. Uh, Munson mentioned that. He said, yes, we have Mr. Armstrong's writings, but we focus, we take it all back to God, all back to the Bible that he inspired. That's where it all starts. Uh, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.21. 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Very short verse here. First Thessalonians 5.21. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. We are not to implicitly believe everything we hear, are we? We examine them according to the word of God. That is the test. That is the standard. The standard of truth is God's word. We're to search the scriptures, whether these things are true or not. Let's go to uh, 2 Thessalonians. I think I can. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 15. Thessalonians, Thessalonians 2.15 Therefore, brethren, stand fast, hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or epistle. God has given us incredible understanding with the help of his end-time apostle. We learned through these traditions, so it's not wrong to look to the apostles, to look to their guidance. But we ultimately take it all back to the word of God. Let's go to 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. There are two different spirits out there. I think we all realize that. But we're to test the spirits, whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we are to test the spirits. There is a different spirit out there. And it manifests itself through deception many times. Whether a person is led by the Holy Spirit, that person's beliefs agree with it, should agree with the truth or the word of God. I don't know if you understand it or not, but I've talked about this in the past, but the, a simplistic mind has a unique filtering system that God implants within us when we're converted. And that filtration system filters all incoming knowledge, all experiences, and it, it sifts it to examine to see if it passes the truth test. That's how it works. That's how our mind should work. Does it agree? We hear things, maybe you young people at school hear things. And you go, does that pass the truth test? If it doesn't, eh, exit out, right? So you young people are experiencing that at school. But God has given you that filter. And you filter it through God's word. You know, a simplistic mind knows that what truth is. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So that is the foundational 
um, reference point. It's God's word. You prove all things through his word. Point number four. All, simpl- all simplistic minds are like-minded. You ever wondered, all of us can sit here, come together, and we think alike, right? We Now there may be some peripheral things we don't always agree with, but um, the doctrines that lead to salvation, we're at one, or we should be. As Mr. Muntz has often said, keep the main thing the main thing. Don't veer off on these little branches. Many have, and they're going to get uh, caught up. The trees, the branch is going to break off with them on the limb. It, it's happened many, many times over and over again. But one of the great miracles, one of the great identifying signs of a simplistic mind that we can come to, together and come up with the same conclusion about life's issues and eternal life's issues, we should be able to. Example, I, I talked about this nation's debt problem, this nation's um, tax problem, the disaster that is taking place there. But I've said this before, if we put 10 of you in the room, the president asked you to solve the debt crisis or the tax problem, how long would it take? We'd go open with prayer first, we'd all pray, and then we'd jump right in, right? And within 20, 30 minutes, we'd be out. And if the president asked to do that and we came out in 30 minutes and said we got a complete answer to your problem, he, he'd think I, we were crazy, wouldn't he? But we all could sit there and go, this is the answer, tithing, God's government. Boom, let's get out. Why? It's the miracle of a simplistic mind in Christ. We think alike, we act alike. Why? Because we're all plugged into the same power source. And that is God. He fuels the mind. We'll always come to the same conclusion. Always. We should. If one, it's one of the proofs that we're on track. Now it's been a rule, in the, rule of thumb. And uh, I've dealt with this myself over the years. People come up with, they got new ideas. Um, And one of the rules of thumb I've always said, look, if you go around and talk to the other brethren and um, your ideas clash with the majority of God's people, what is the problem? Who is the problem? Maybe you need to go back and rethink delve into a simplistic mind that is fueled by God's spirit. Many have an ego. Many want to be smart and wise in the eyes of the other brethren. Well, they lack humility. Simplistic mind doesn't think that way. It's filled with humility. What do I know that God hasn't taught me or his servants? But some are much smarter than their teachers. And it is a shame. Many are being deceived and will be deceived as we go forward. Paul admonished us to be like-minded. Let's go to Philippians 2. Philippians 2, 1 through 5. Therefore, if there, am I there? Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any of affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, having the same love being of one accord and of one mind that is only possible through God's spirit and that simplistic mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conduct. There it is, brethren. Don't come up with ideas because you're that smart. 
but let it be done through let it not be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Totally contrary to the world. Assist, that is a simplistic mind. It's at one with God. It's at one with its brethren. Simplicity in Christ strives to be like-minded. Okay. Uh, one more here. Point number five. Five. A simplistic mind does not compl complicate God's way of life. And I have an example of that. An example that I never forgot all these years. Um, but this took place back in the, my days in Worldwide. Uh, this was just before it veered completely off track. Um, but one of the leaders made a shocking statement that stuck with me to this day. He said, unless you have a good working knowledge and understanding of the Greek language, you cannot fully and truly understand the word of God. Of course, I want proof, right? Where did he get this idea from? It kept coming back to me, God's way of life is not complicated or I wouldn't be here. If we're led by that spirit, it is God's understanding that he imparts to us. It's not based on how smart you and I are. It's not based on how much wisdom we have. It is not based on whether we have a college degree or not. But these idea and this idea came right out of the world. God's ways are very clear, precise, and simple. Never forget it. It's the plain truth. It's the true trees. It's not complicated. That's a trait of the world. That was a trait of the Jews of Christ's day. They were noted for their complicating things adding to the Sabbath, to his laws, burdening people. Only God, never forget, can make things simple. And it's proof over in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Only God can simplify his way of life. Simplification is in is the sophistication, as I said. He's the smartest being in the universe, and yet he is the most simplistic being you will ever come in contact with. Let's go to Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you, that, I've, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. How great is the God we serve? He simplifies life. He brings it down to a couple common denominators. Choose life, choose death. Which is it? Choose to be blessed by obedience disobedience curses don't complicate God's way of life young people it is that simple you're making choices now that will affect you way into the future choose life choose the blessings it's simple it's ten commandments it's not ten thousand laws or twenty thousand laws on the books that is a world influenced by Satan, the devil, that complicates life. One last scripture before we close here. Let's go to 2 Timothy 3, 13. The simplistic mind is under attack. 
2 Timothy 3.13. But evil men and postures will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is a prophet's, uh, prophetic event that is taking place at the end of an age. And we have that concern in the church of God today, just as Paul did. Many are being deceived and being deceived. And as Paul said, lest some, somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He is attacking that simplicity. Make no mistake. He would like to derail all of us because that simplistic mind is the link to eternal life. Deception starts in the mind, brethren. It starts there. It is only when the qualities that make up the simplistic person or that is in Christ are compromised can we be deceived. If we have those particular qualities of a little child that was commended by Jesus, which is humility, freedom from prejudice, teachableness, lovableness, trustfulness, faith, freedom from anxiety and innocence then the childlike believer in his innocence has that unrestrained trust and faith in God so if we truly possess these qualities of that simplistic person in Christ understand we cannot be deceived and will not be deceived so let's strive to have that simplistic mind that is in Christ. For more information, go to our website at cogassembly.org. Copyright 2022, Church of God Assembly. All rights reserved.